Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the IDWF webinar on domestic work, but not domestic abuse. Yesterday, November 25th, was the International Day to End Violence Against Women. Domestic workers have a lot of experiences, unfortunately, to many forms of violence and abuses due to how we work at private homes, invisible, informal, and lack of legal protections, lack of the opportunity to assess justice system. We have a lot to say about femicide, which is the theme of the International Day to End Violence Against Women this year. And we have to stop it now for domestic workers and every women in every corner of the world. Today, we are very proud to have come together to share our stories, but also to build power of domestic workers and also with our allies. We are going to have two panels today. The first one will be joined by two distinguished speakers who are feminists, but also fighters for women's rights and collaborators with our affiliates on the ground. And from the IDWF, the panel will be kickstarted by Murtu Wiboy, our president, and to conclude by Satya, the president of the Domestic Workers Union in Sri Lanka. She is a domestic worker and she has been organizing domestic workers in her region, Kandy, in the past six, eight years, eight years. And we are very, very privileged to have Elba Nunes from the Latin America and Caribbean Committee for the Defense of Women's Rights. She is a social worker and lawyer, researcher and university's teacher and a collaborator of our Union of Domestic Workers of Paraguay, the Sintra Desby. And then we have Cindy. She's also a feminist, a powerful woman. She has been a domestic worker herself in Lebanon since 2014. She is now bringing the community of the Cameroonian domestic workers together to fight for this, fight against the same problems that are related to the kafala system. So before we start, I want to remind us and each of everyone that uh, there is interpretation of many languages. So English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, Bahasa Indonesia, Nepali, Swahili, Tamil, and Thai. So go to the interpretation button, click on it and find the language that you want. Okay, without further delay, uh, let me uh, call upon our president, Myrtle Wiboy, to kickstart the panel. And each of the speaker will have six minutes. So when there is only one minute left, you will see, I raise my hand. So when you see this hand, you know you have only one minute to go to wrap up your presentation because uh, time is very, very tight as usual. And I hope you will bear with us and um, uh, use the six minutes so that we will have time for, for questions and, and discussions. Okay, is Myrtle here? 
Uh, yes. Myrtle has just joined as attendee and uh, she is joining in the panel, but we still need uh, one or two more minutes. Okay, let, let us wait, let us wait. So while we are waiting for our president Myrtle Wilboy to case start, uh, uh, I want to share with you that uh, IDWF has prioritized anti-violence, anti-abuse in our work for this year and next year. So be with us and be our collaborator. Berto is here. Welcome, Berto. I'm here. <laughs> okay, please uh, start, kick start our, our webinar. Berto is our president and she's a general secretary of the South Africa Domestic and Ally Workers Unions. And she is here uh, to speak on our workplace as a private household I isolation for domestic workers and what it is like when we talk about domestic violence. Myrtle, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, good day everybody. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Although the topic is not that pleasant today, we are living in a world that is full of gender-based violence. And we, we don't know if it is because we are vulnerable women. We don't know if it's because we are just domestic workers migrant workers, we're not sure what it is, but we just know that every year when we launch 16 days of activism, it gets worse and worse. And the people that suffer the most are the vulnerable women. And surely the time has come now for us to really start thinking, how will we stop this gender-based violence? How will we stop this because we are women away from our families? We are also women that get abused by our families. We are women that get abused by our employers. So how do we stand and how do we actually fight? The answer is lying right here with us. We as women have to say enough is enough. We as women have to say, we don't just want 16 days of activism, we want safety every day of our life. We as women want to say, stop giving us 16 days, giving us all years, give us every day of the year, give us solid protection. Listen to us when we go to courtrooms, don't always delay cases and actually in court, let us go through all of this. So today, our message as IDWF, our message at the different organizations at that time is clear. We are going to start shouting and screaming. We are going to say, we are going to free ourselves. Did we not form the IDWF? Because we say we want to be united. We form the IDWF because we say as women, we need to free ourselves. We don't just want to free ourselves from exploitation at work. We want to free ourselves. Our lives matter. And we want to free ourselves that when we walk in the street, that when we go outside, when we go to our work, we want to feel safe. We want to get into public transport and we want to feel safe. We don't want to look behind our shoulder any longer. So as the IDWF president, as the ESCO member of the IDWF, 
We say today, let us start shouting. Let us start screaming. And let us go to those high profile people that is in a safety net where violence is not reaching them. So why should they care about us? So we have to go to them today. And from tomorrow, we have to shout at every corner. We have to even now that the ILO is in process, make our voices together. And oh, shame gender-based violence. Stop gender-based violence. So today, as we go into the seminar, as we're going to hear about the views of the vulnerable sector, as we're going to hear of how we can go forward and how we can make sure that the IDWF is a voice to be reckoned with, that the IDWF is a strong, solid foundation. I was very sad a few days ago when they look at the IDWF that we are just a woman organization. We're going to prove them wrong. We're going to prove them we are strong women. We are women that want to free ourselves. So all lives matter. And from today on, our life will matter. And 16 days of activism will become each day free of violence, free of abuse. I thank you all. I look forward to the discussion. I look forward to learn more from you. Welcome, Elizabeth. Welcome all the executive members. Welcome all these countries. Let us go forward and let us free ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Myrtle. Yes, that is why we have the IDWF to unite all domestic workers to have strong power so that no one will dare to act violence on us. And, uh, and also now we have a, a very powerful tool that is the Convention 190 to end harassments, violence in the world of work, and together we will win. And now let me give the floor to the first speaker, Elba Nunes, and uh, she's from Paraguay and she has a lot to share with us what she thinks about the violence and, and what must we do together. The floor is yours, Alba. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, everyone, all our comrades around the world. I'd like to also Say hello in my mother tongue in Guarani. And what I just said means that I hope that everyone is safe. I'd like to thank the IDWF for organizing this webinar in line with what the president of uh, the IDWF just mentioned. I was a domestic worker myself in my younger years, and finally I could achieve a university studies. I'd like to point out that this call made by the IDWF within this framework is to reflect about non-abuse towards domestic workers, and also the idea to organize ourselves against violence. And I'd like to acknowledge the millions of uh, women that are paid domestic workers, not just in Latin America, but around the world. We talk about women mainly that come from farm areas, indigenous, Afro-descendant women, migrant women, and they all have in common facing discrimination and violence in the workplace. And in this regard, one of the principles that I'd like to share with you has to do with domestic work and paid domestic worker, which has been historically subject to uh, inequalities. And we know that not just in Latin America, but around the world, there has been a double standard. It seems like domestic workers are poor, are indigenous, are migrant our Afro-descendant, and we can continue thinking of multiple ways of discriminating these women 
in the domestic work areas. And this is based on gender. And in this regard, we can say that this is not really about women being vulnerable themselves or weak themselves, but it has to do with these patriarch structures um, in our society that reproduce and re-strengthen gender violence as a natural phenomenon. And it is also expressed in the lack of ownership of women, not just about their own decisions regarding their bodies, but also about their lives. But they become even stronger within the workplace because these two dimensions are crossed. It is clear that although the contribution that they make to society is large, they have not been sufficiently recognized, such as other sectors within the labor force in different countries around the world. And we clearly see that this system, not just gender violence, but it's not only recognized as a structural issue created by this patriarch system, but there's a colonial system as well, in which to some extent, this idea of the origin based on labor, um, slavery and unfair conditions of labor are still strengthening. Many of our comrades today can attest to what they feel in their bodies and in their lives is um, reinforced and re-strengthened by the state itself and also by the institutional power structures. We know that the extreme, extreme gender violence expressions, not just psychological, sexual, um, patrimonial, violence and different violent situations that domestic workers face in the workplace, but femicide as an extreme expression of violence, the murder of women due to their gender is not absent in the domestic world. And in this regard, we know that um, a very renowned case, the case of the murder of uh, our comrade Maribel back in 2009 in Honduras is just a small signal of the issue of femicides and the murder of domestic workers because of being domestic workers. This phenomenon is present, but we can also add that it has not been sufficiently studied documented and reported. I hope we better understand how these patriarch and colonial structures work upon poor, displaced, migrant, indigenous, domestic workers. We know that there's progress being made. We cannot deny that what has occurred and taken place in Latin America in the past few years in terms of uh, contributions made by the feminist movement in the sense that uh, the movement Ni Una Menos or Not a Single Woman Less that was born from the feminist movement that comes to witness or show what the femicide phenomenon is like in Latin America, murder of women just because of being women. And today, it's been um, expanded throughout the region and it managed to um, include in the regional agenda, the gender perspective. And in this sense, domestic workers in Latin America are also articulated, mobilized, and based on what our comrade just said, we need to come out, we need to speak up, we need to demand public policies that prevent these type of practices. These practices need to be sanctioned and eradicated. We can also add that thanks to the organizational strength 
of feminist and domestic workers articulated through mobilizing procedures have actually made significant progress regarding harassment and abuse that are now recognized um, right now at the ILO level and place the obligation of the state and not just the obligation of the state, but also the obligation of uh, workers and both female and male employers to contribute and make this issue more visible so that we can all sanction and eradicate gender violence within the workplace. And when we talk about violence, we talk about gender violence. We talk about inequalities in the power relation within a certain structure in society. We're still worried about the lack of effective mechanisms to, um, to make this more visible. Even though most of uh, women have survived different means of, uh, of violence based on um, their patrimony, their gender, sexual violence, psychological violence, verbal violence, there's still uh, a big debt that we have towards them. And in this last part of my presentation, let me just outline the list of the pending debt that we have to guarantee lives free of violence for domestic workers. In the first place, I'd like to include that organized domestic workers need to strengthen their organization. So that is the first step, that is the starting point. But also it's important for them to become part of the reproductive uh, work, become part of the democracy. This still lies with women and they carry the burden of working because they have to fulfill more than just one role. They, they actually play three roles and they, this puts them in a very vulnerable and discriminatory situation for them to exercise their rights. It's urgent for states to put an end to precarious labor conditions where violence and discrimination are perpetuated together with historical inequalities, but also organizations beyond the states, both the employers and employees organizations have to work together to eradicate violence and harassment in the workplace and guarantee efficient measures so that we can prevent, sanction and eradicate violence. Finally, I'd like to leave you with these words. Paid domestic work is a key part for the sustainability of human life and the operation of our societies, our households, the economy and our, and our society at large. Therefore, I'd like to ask the states to ratify Convention 190, make sure that policies have enough budget and resources to eradicate sanction gender violence, but also establish compensation mechanisms. The only way to do so is to strengthen our democracies and human rights in our region and around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Elber. Uh, you have uh, uh, rightly pointed out that uh, femicide is a very, very big problem within the domestic workers sector. And, and that uh, governments need to ratify the Convention 190 and to implement the Convention 190 to address this problem. Okay, now let us um, uh, hear from the second speaker, Cindy from Lebanon. Cindy, the floor is yours. You have six minutes. Cindy. Oh. Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Je m'appelle Cindy, militante féministe et travailleuse domestique depuis 2014. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am a feminist and have been since the year 2014. I'd like to tell you what work is for us. Work is defined 
as a set of, uh, just a moment, please. Cindy, please unmute. We're just waiting for the audio of the speaker. Désolé, uh, j'ai eu des imprévus. Je disais que bien que le travail Apologies for this uh, inconvenience. I was saying that work is defined as the set of activities, human activities organized to produce what is useful for society. We, as domestic workers in Lebanon, have uh, protested against the kafala system so that the system can be eliminated, eradicated, and prohibited. This system represses us, and this system makes us modern slaves in 2021 because we are abused, we are raped, we're mistreated, our passports are kept away from us and we are considered their own property. Even when a migrant worker comes out to um, denounce this, it's as if um, our lives have no value. They have no importance at the light and eyes of the state. We are witness of many domestic workers' uh, murders. Some women that are dropped from a second floor of a house and many other abuses and harassment situations that um, we've known of in the workplace. The state and the government knows about it, but nothing happens. There's no investigation carried out. We, as migrant domestic workers in Lebanon, have asked the authorities in this country for this exploitation system to be eradicated. This system that violates any fundamental right of human beings. Migrant workers need to be acknowledged and recognized by law, labor law in Lebanon, because we, we work and we work within different families' environments and we are exposed to harassment and other mistreatment. In 2021, migrant domestic workers in Lebanon are asking for the system to be eradicated and for the government to take action because it's unbelievable that in this time and in these days, this system is still happening in this region of the world. We should be recognized by the, the law in Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. Yeah, in the kafala system, which is an extreme form of exploitation for migrant domestic workers. And it is just totally unacceptable that this system still exists today. And it, it has to be stopped. It has to be eradicated now. And due to a lot of strong actions in the region and around the world, some governments in the region have started to say, we will abolish it. But of course, it's just lip service. They have not done anything, but we will keep pushing them and reminding them that they have to abolish it for, for us, for all workers. Okay, now let us uh, move to Sri Lanka. Uh, Satya, the president of the Domestic Workers Union in Sri Lanka. Uh, 
Sophia. Are you here? Hello? She is there. Okay. Is that here? You have problem to connect? Uh, Sadia has sent us a video, so we should screen the video in a few. Okay, okay. So while we are waiting, uh, I want to tell everyone that the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Form of Slavery, uh, Tomaya Obukata, will be visiting Sri Lanka soon to make assessment on slavery, on the contemporary form of slavery, especially uh, in the domestic uh, child labor, child soldier sector. So this will be an opportunity for domestic workers for our village to speak up, to tell their stories and, and to expose the, the, the problem in the countries. So who is going to share the screen? Uh, perhaps we can read the English script because she has also sent us the English script. Okay, who, who will do that? I could, if you could hear okay, me. Please. Okay, please. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, so this is from Satya. She's saying, my greetings to you all. I am Satya from the Domestic Workers Unions in reference to Sri Lanka. We are a trade union, which was the first to be registered and functioning in a proper manner. In order for our workers to be recognized and accepted, we are mobilizing them and continuing to carry our activities. We have workers from all over the island who are members of our trade union. Likewise, our objective is for domestic work to be respected and the government should establish it as a profession of dignity. Keeping this as the central theme, we are working on several parts of the country. Our trade union works amongst workers at building their knowledge capacity, sensitizing them on the dignity of labor, their rights, labor laws, and to facilitate identifying, analyzing, and resolving their issues. We have been successful in these activities. In the present scenario, we have grown to a state where we could talk about our rights and as a trade union engage in direct bargaining for the first time with our government stakeholders. I am proud to mention this as the president of the Domestic Workers Union, because nowhere have we heard of workers uh, engaging in bargaining. Our trade union is a complete exception. Our trade union is led by workers engaged in all activities. It is a remarkable feature, and I am very happy to share this. Likewise, if you look at the structure of our trade union at the village level, we have a village committee at the district level, district committee, and we have an administrative committee at the regional level. This is how our structure operates. All positions are held by workers. Our objective is that domestic work should be transformed as a dignified profession in Sri Lanka. The workers who are oppressed and suppressed should win all their rights under their leadership, especially the women workers should be freed from slavery 
and recognize uh, the exploitation and win their rights, be it at their work location or elsewhere. They should raise their voices against all forms of violation of their rights and be victorious. This is our objective. Further, we have been working in this sector for over 10 years. It is concerning that the government of Sri Lanka continues to be indifferent. In the past, as a trade union, we have conducted several struggles. Also, though we have held discussions with the government side, the Ministry of Labor, the Secretary to the Ministry of Labor, our legal protections still remain at question in Sri Lanka. This is why the death of Ms. Hishalini was much talked about for several months in the past. Many are aware of this during that time. The government workers and many others voiced uh, their opinions about the incident, the cabinet, the opposition party members, ruling party ministers alike. Though everyone spoke about it, today everyone knows that it still remains a question to date. Though Hashilani was a girl child, she was a domestic worker and she was a girl domestic worker. We raised our voice against the violence. You all are aware that we conducted several protests and struggles with our members from different parts of the country and at the regional level through our regional office. We prioritized this issue and wanted recognition as domestic workers. And we pointed out that such incidents were taking place due to the lack of protection of domestic workers. At that time, the Minister of Labor held an in-person discussion with us and promised to implement legal protection for domestic workers within two weeks time. Three months have lapsed, but nothing has happened. In this sector, most of the workers are women. And as a trade union, I can firmly say that there is no discrimination on the basis of ethnicity or religion. Women of all ethnicities are working as domestic workers, but we do not know why the government has not, not implemented the law as of yet. This is why it has been made into a business. The cause of Hishalini's death is heartbreaking. I came to know recently that due to COVID-19 situation, many girls are going to Colombo for work through brokers. We are on the lookout for additional information. Though we are duly registered and well functioning in Sri Lanka, due to the lack of legal protection, the broker system and agencies, recruitment agencies continue because of the government who gives them registration numbers. They want the money. Since the money is the main focus, they even take children for labor. The government holds the responsibility to respond to this issue. Though Shilani's death hit the headlines and many were talking about it, no one has asked about what was done about it. Nothing has been done yet. And our struggles will continue. In conclusion, I would like to say that Till such time we win our rights, the domestic worker unions will not subside. Thank you. Sadia, you are here. Do you have anything to add? We have heard your statement read by Rola. We are fully together with you. We salute you for having led a, a strong union in Sri Lanka that gives so much hope to domestic workers in the country. And that will make sure the stories like Shanini will not happen again, not in Sri Lanka and not anywhere. So Shanini, you still have a minute left. Do you want to say some, something? There is translation. Uh, yeah, on Tamil and English. No? Yeah, maybe you can uh, come. She's uh, unable to connect to the Zoom, but she says Ishalini is a girl child, but even little children are being used for labor. Yes, yes, this is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Satya. 
Okay, now I open the floor for questions and uh, any comments from, from the floor. So all of you. We have one question from Sheila in the questions and answer box. Um, can I see this? Okay. Okay, uh, there is a question from Sheila. Uh, what do you mean by migrant workers are not recognized in Lebanon and labor law? I would like to know more and how do you shake the system and let the voices of migrant workers be heard, especially women migrant workers, domestic workers. Thank you. Cindy, would you like to reply to this? So her question is, why you say migrant workers are not recognized in Le Lebanon labor law? Cindy, are you there? Oui, bonjour. Mm. Bonjour. Oui. So the question uh, is... Can someone uh, repeat the question? Yes, the question is, why do you say migrant domestic workers are not protected by the labor law in Lebanon? Euh, oui, euh, les travailleurs domestiques ne sont pas inclus dans la loi euh, du travail libanaise parce que domestic ont... workers are not included in labor law in Lebanon because the kafala system is a different system that is not recognized under the Lebanon law. As a result of that, to start when we will go to Lebanon to work, this system is done in conjunction by the general security, by the Ministry of Labor that does not recognize labor law for domestic workers and puts this in a separate place. That is to say that the employer can do whatever they want and each employer can decide about the rights of the worker. For example, if they decide not to pay their workers, we as domestic workers cannot uh, raise a complaint or make a complaint before the police or before the authorities, the consular authorities. We cannot do that. So the employer has the absolute right about or over domestic workers. They can do anything they want with us. So we're completely at their disposal and under the or their orders. And that is why we say that migrant domestic workers are not recognized under labor law in Lebanon, because this is a system that was prepared to control mm -hmm. women, the women that want to go to work to Lebanon. Thank you, Cindy. Yes, so basically uh, under the Kafala system, the employers have absolute power over their domestic workers and and labor law is just not there to to protect them uh i don't see any more questions uh and i want to uh give the floor to elba you know after hearing the stories in lebanon in asia sri lanka uh do you uh, have any comments, you know, especially on how do you compare this situation in, in your region? Well, first, I would like to thank Cindy and the colleague that told us about the innumerable forms of violation of rights, because that's what we're talking about. This is what they're going through. And this has to do with violations to their human rights and their rights as workers. And in this regard, I would like to say only that we need to think about 
other society that is possible. Only by organizing the world can go around. So this path of uh, our conquests in Latin America, this is the result of the historical fight of those who came before us. Mm -hmm. So many women that fought to change their society. So it is possible to change. It is possible to, world a to build a different world where domestic workers are on an equal footing as everybody else because in connection with the question asked by our colleague the the law might contemplate equality formal equality but there is a gap between the law and the facts there's a long way between the law and the facts it's not enough to have laws we also need to organize ourselves and to fight so that the laws become a reality there's a question in the chat box from another colleague that says, why do we talk about gender-based violence and mm -hmm. only mention women? And I would like to say that clearly, gender-based violence affects both men and women, of course. Gender-based violence shows us that the, the body of women is the one that receives all the impact of deliberate violence caused by the patriarchal system but also we are including any sexual dissidents and all possible expressions of gender because let's agree that at least in my country paraguay trans women are killed and assassinated just because of their condition they're being just trans women and they're um, these murders are not investigated. So I want to point out that this has to do with covering all forms of expression of gender. And so in this regard, it is possible to build a different world and a different society by organizing ourselves to be able to change this. So this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Elber, uh, by uh, concluding with uh, a, a lot of optimism. And this optimism is possible when we organize. And here we have heard from Sakia. She is leading a powerful union of domestic workers in Sri Lanka. And we have heard Cindy in Lebanon, despite the kafala system, she is mobilizing the Cameronian domestic workers uh, to come together to fight. So th the future is hopeful. Thank you all the panelists, all the we have this uh, uh, wonderful panel and, and uh, let us be empowered. And, and now uh, I want to uh, give the floor to uh, my colleagues uh, who will start the second panel, uh, Rola. It is wonderful to be with you here and to have listened uh, to the experiences of our first panelists. Uh, our second panel would move to discussing how are domestic workers changing these structural realities. Usually, today we are focusing on femicide or the most extreme violence that women would face on the basis of them being women. Usual standard definitions would look at this in matters that are cultural, for example, addressing genital mutilation, addressing certain uh, practices that happen uh, in community. Uh, rather than addressing structural economic um, barriers that would prevent women from having their full dignified rights. Also, other aspects of the regular definitions would look at intimate partner violence, so they would address it in an individual manner. Here we have heard that many of these struggles are communitarian and many of these struggles could be alleviated by improving labor laws, by providing forms of protection. And in this panel, we will hear exactly about that, about what are our leaders doing to uh, better the uh, context which domestic workers navigate. With us, uh, I will first give the floor to Asmao Ba, who is the General Secretary of Sinem Guinea. She's also the President of the African Domestic Workers Network. Uh, Asma would share with us the experience of her union in uh, collaborating with 
uh, officials to end gender-based violence. Go ahead, Asmal. Asma, would you like to start? Oui, bonjour tout le monde. Je suis désolé pour la connexion tout de suite, mais heureusement que Mela s'est venu à bon moment. Good morning, everyone. My connection is not very good. Today, we will talk about gender violence associated with domestic work as a union. Work towards creating awareness for domestic workers. Work on the sensitization work with them. the sensitization work together with the NGOs safety actions and conclusions. Let's start by sensitization. This activity has to do with creating awareness and sensitivity amongst domestic workers where who work in different households with girls and boys so that they can eradicate physical, moral, psychological violence at work. We'd like to create awareness within the family because this is where it starts. Education within the families, parents, mothers and fathers, they have to explain to their children what this is about, what this violence is about. Parents, both fathers and mothers, should not hit their children and that's where it all starts and then we take this to society we need education at schools we also need education amongst teachers we see that in other countries or in some countries there's no civic education and many of these societies are based on religious practices so when we go to different churches, we see that there's lack of education there as well. De la société. And that's why we need to sensitize and create more awareness among society. In terms of collaboration with human rights and NGO, to end gender-based violence, we work with NGOs to defend human rights, to create a synergy of action. We also work with security services, particularly with police and the gendarmerie. We carry out different actions with the police and the gendarmerie and their specialized services in the defense of the rights of vulnerable people, which are at the police level, the Office for the Protection of Gender and Children, called Opergen, when we encounter situations where children are victims, we will with a special brigade for the protection of these people, of these vulnerable people, women and children, girls and boys. We work with people who were victims and we work in joint collaboration with the gendarmerie as well. We work jointly with health services and justice. We work with the police and the gendarmerie. We associate health services and justice with them. Our union works with forensic personnel so that we can have access to important documents in this regard. In terms of uh, the justice system, we work with lawyers whose fees are paid by human rights organizations, our union, and OGDH has to 
the care for victims of violence. Most of the time, victims of violence and mistreatment are taken care of by the OGDA, which people of goodwill in our union as well. The care given to these victims includes temporary housing, reintegration, and return of the, these children to their parents and their households once the situation has been resolved. And personally, when we find someone who is victim of violence, we resort to gener the gendarmerie or the police because sometimes we have to separate the employers from the domestic workers. We provide them with a 10 day period. Example, we go before the courts and then we can take the children to their parents. You can see this girl on this picture, she was electrocuted by her boss with an iron. You can see in the picture how cruel society can become against young children and young girls in particular. Because she was accused of uh, stealing money for a phone. She was kidnapped and harassed and then electrocuted with an iron. We presented ourselves before court. The employers were sent to prison and she was reunited with their parents. This girl is only 10 years old. And that's why my introduction, I said that education starts in the household and then moves along to society. This girl was sent to a particular house where she was taken care of. She does not go to school because she works for this employer. She was fired from her own house and we could get in touch with her. We sent her to church where she was derived to a house where family could take care of. So that then she could um, reunite with her family. This happened last year, and then she was sent to school. Yes. She's a very smart girl. She had uh, the second best average at the end of this school year. With this cooperation received by all these parties, we were able to win this battle. So, in order to fight again against violence phenomenon, we have to talk to our children. Parents have to talk with them. Sometimes families do not talk about sex with their children. For 20 years, for 20 years, this other girl was raped and when she went to the doctor, they realized that she had been raped. Now, where were the parents? Where was the conversation with them? Parents have to talk with the children about sex and they have to find the right space and time to share these experiences. There was a girl that did not know what the menstruation was and ha that's how she became pregnant without even knowing so. She was um, expelled from her own house. 
doctors raped her. She was then taken back to the hospital. She had to go through an abortion and then she died. This 25 year old woman was a victim of a collective rape and went through an abortion of an unwanted pregnancy. She was a victim of a malpractice and passed away. So what we want to do here is to take action, to report this case of violence and talk to parents so that they can prepare their children. We need to support victims for them to feel brave enough to speak up. They cannot remain in silence and the law needs to be applied. These people can be taken to different offices and there's no good result out of this. We work so that actors and stakeholders can be part of this synergy and carry out these actions at all, all levels. Women and rescuing young women and girls from terrible situations. Also for the education that you are doing with domestic workers and with potential allies, with people in authority positions, because oftentimes, as you have already mentioned, when a woman seeks support from an authority, be it a medical authority, like in your example, or otherwise, she might also encounter violence. So it is very essential that you are providing some safe spaces, safe refuge, and uh, comrades and sisters who can assist these women through accessing forms of justice and rehabilitation uh, after suffering through such uh, great violence. Uh, thank you, Asmao. On to our next speaker, who is Claribet Palacios. Uh, Claribet, you're here, so welcome. And uh, Claribet will be uh, talking to us. Yeah, so Claribet will be speaking to us about uh, the context of Afro-Colombian workers. She is the president of the Union of Afro-Colombian Workers of Domestic Service. And she is uh, the founder and an active member of the Intersyndical uh, Domestic Workers Union. She is a representative for domestic workers as well in the tripartite table for the follow-up on the ratification and implementation of C189. And she is a member of the Intersectoral Roundtable on the care economy also on behalf of her union. Uh, welcome, Clary Bad. The floor is yours. Could you unmute? Yeah. Muy buenos días. Good morning. I hope you're all very well. I would like to thank the IDWF for the opportunity that once again it gives me to represent Colombian domestic workers with my voice. In this particular case, I am the president of an organization currently. And I would like to congratulate the previous panelists. They were fantastic in their presentations. And so through the different uh, presentations and interventions that there were, there's a common denominator, and that is the gender-based violence within the households where domestic workers work. And so to give you an idea, I have focused my presentation around the three questions that were sent previously. And so if I had to mention, or I would like to say that in the framework of the constant violence or constant exercise of violence, there is a violent continuum. And when we talk about a continuum, we're making reference basically to the violence that can be suffered by a single woman by working 
as a domestic worker, particularly because this uh, union brings together women domestic workers, 80% of whom are eight, uh, Afro, uh, from African Colombian descent and 20% and mestizos or indigenous uh, women. And so we are Colombian, but in that segregation that is done by class, by gender, by race, there is or it becomes very evident that, it, that uh, there is a distinction because of these or by reason of these conditions. And this distinction is used by some employers in general to reinforce the phenomenon of gender-based violence and racial discrimination. So even though domestic work, in, in domestic work, any woman can be a victim through several research papers and assignments that Colombia has done, we made it evident that that gender violence is worse when we're talking about an African descendant, a woman from African descent who's a migrant, who has a low level of education. And when we're talking about a woman who is underage. So when I was a teenager, I was a victim of I was a victim of people trafficking. And as Asmao pointed out, I hope I pronounced her name correctly, she was saying, she was talking about a girl who was taken away from her family and they, she was taken from one place to another under a slavery situation. And I, I only experienced that situation in one place. Fortunately, I was able to leave. And I'm making reference to this, not because of me, but because of the violence that is experienced by minors who work as domestic workers. And something that I'd like to say, which might be something that is questioning or, or that might, people might wonder why I mentioned this, but this, somebody before me said that this starts with the education with, within families. And if we wonder that if there's more than 52% women in the world, why do we end up suffering gender-based violence? Why? do we suffer from discrimination? Why, if we are the majority, why do we end up being the victims of a patriarchal system, of capitalism, of a chauvinistic system, if we are the ones that we give birth to the children? Because also it's been shown that a significant part of violence is executed by men. This doesn't mean that women are, might not be or could not be violent. Women can be violent, but most women who work within households as domestic workers are also household heads. Uh, but in the household that we work, many times the woman is the head. And so one would think that by working for a woman, this behavior could be different, but we see how the power given to uh, our fellow women and with the class distinction and the social and economic situation and difference, how they are the ones that reinforce discrimination and gender-based violence. So when I'm asked, how does the union address and treat women who suffer, who are victims of violence? The first thing we do is to provide a space so that women can come and can start to identify their violent situations because you know that there are many situations of violence, economic violence, sexual violence, harassment, property violence. And when I said that there's a continuum in violence and I say that a single woman can experience all these kinds of violence within the household of their employers. So if we don't teach women to identify these different types of violence, it's likely that they won't know 
that they're being subject to violence and they won't be able to f seek help before the competent authorities or the competent agencies and institutions that the country has to address these cases. And so the first thing that the union does is to receive the woman, listen to the woman, see how we can accompany the woman, because many times they don't tell about these situations in their households, in their in their homes, because they become victims again, they become re-victimized. And so we give them shelter and we teach them what the path is. And the first thing is to raise awareness so that they are they dare um, leave fear behind, because you cannot make a complaint if you're afraid. And then the second thing I want to say in my presentation is how we pressure governments. It was very well said already by the presentation that uh, by the introduction they gave of me. So I am part of the uh, group that follows up Convention 189 representing the union. And we not only pressure the government for the convention to be implemented effectively and efficiently, because you know that it's very difficult to achieve a efficient a applicability of C-189. And so sometimes we are at 80, 90% because what is ratified is only complied with in a minimum percentage. So we have new provisions that were um, enforced, but compliance is very low. And we have been fighting very strongly to try to have an inspection conducted to the houses where domestic workers work, because this model, with this model, violence will decrease for sure. And to wrap up with the last questions about question about the opportunities that we have identified in the framework of the pandemic in Colombia, it uh, the pandemic hit the country very seriously and so we see an opportunity and that is that the care of life has been put at the center and this center includes paid domestic work this has been a tremendous opportunity to render a problem visible a, a problem that became even worse in the country and the pandemic made this evident. It put it on the public tables, on the discussion. And for many feminist women or feminist workers and domestic worker women, the domestic worker organizations and movements were able to start pushing for public policy to be able to prevent this um, violence. Also, including within these opportunities for the sectors. I want to mention the recent adoption of Convention 190 by the ILO. This convention could save life. And the Colombian domestic workers, women, uh, domestic worker movement pushes for raising the voice on behalf of the domestic sector to push um, complaints for violence and harassment at the workplace as a priority to start eradicating this in the households and in society as a whole so that domestic workers can have spaces that are free from gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claribet. We could listen to you forever and ever about the violence continuum. We hear oftentimes that domestic workers would consider violence as part of the job, quote unquote, and it should not be the conflation between the domestic sphere and the sphere of employment, as you have rightfully mentioned. The ratification of C-190 is uh, essential and awareness raising also uh, in order to fight at different levels of this continuum of violence. We should have had with us today Joyce Hewitt from, uh, from the Caribbean, from Jamaica but I'm afraid she did not make it. However, we do have her speaking notes. So I will introduce Joyce before my colleague uh, would read to us the notes that Joyce has shared with us. So 
Joyce Hewitt is the co-founder and the executive director of Women Incorporated, uh, which is a voluntary NGO that was founded in 1984. Uh, the work of this NGO is inspired by the creative energies of women and allies from all walks of life, and it is dedicated to providing assistance to the survivors of rape, incest, domestic crisis, sexual harassment, at the workplace, the human trafficking, and domestic violence. Joyce Hewitt is one of the founders and runs a shelter in Jamaica as well, which helps battered and disenfranchised women. She uh, could not be with us today, and Daphne, my colleague, would read her speech for us, and we thank her for sending it so we can hear the voice of the Caribbean in this session. Daphne? Today, I will address a situation that occurs at a workplace that is one for which domestic workers are most vulnerable. It is a work situation that not only robs the domestic workers of their dignity, it robs the domestic workers of their rights. It is at a very core to IO decent work agenda, given that both productive While and While Daphne gets ready, I will remind us that we can type some questions. We will still have a few minutes left before the end of this webinar and we had also received a question from Christine that asked how do we move domestic work from informality to formality because a lot of the protections uh, come with the formalization of the sector and she is interested to hear your experiences about that. Today Daphne, uh, are you around? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, good. Today, I will address a situation that occurs at the workplace that is one for which domestic workers are most vulnerable. It is a work situation that not only robs the domestic workers of their dignity, it robs the domestic workers of their rights. It is at the very core the IO decent work agenda, given that both productive employment and decent work are key elements to achieving fair globalization and poverty reduction. Therefore, we cannot talk developing an agenda for the community of work, rights at work, social protection, and gender equality without due consideration of the IOC 190 as a cross-cutting objective. Taking into account that domestic workers work at the confines of private households and are workers who perform direct and indirect care service, ranging from all aspects of housekeeping, which may or may not include cleaning, cooking, washing, ironing clothes, taking care of children, elderly or sick family members. The nature of work may entail gardening, guarding the house or even driving chores. Domestic worker may work full-time or part-time and may live in or live out of the household, mostly depending on the need as defined by the respective head of the household. As such vital members of the care economy, domestic workers are still most, most vulnerable to sexual harassment at the workplace. Recent indicators highlight the fact that of 75.6 million domestic workers worldwide, 76.2% are women. Not to suggest that the remaining quarter of domestic workers that are men might not experience sexual harassment at the workplace, but merely to stress that the numbers speak for themselves. One of the most important part of the equation is that it is the inequality of gender at work. Domestic work is the most important source of employment among female employees than among their male counterparts. In many Caribbean countries, domestic workers is a necessary part of the economy. Yet there are little or no safeguards in place that provide protection by law or policy to address prevention or incorporate sanction of the offense. Recognition that sexual harassment at the workplace is rooted in the privacy of home or too often behind closed doors render the action among the most insidious of offense of this nature that one can imagine. From the unsolicited, unwanted, inappropriate physical touching to the verbal or non-verbal gesture, sexually explicit pictures or poster, 
suggestive comments or jokes, intrusive questions, sexually explicit emails or text messages, or even direct requests for sex. With regard to breaking down the barrier that allows sexual harassment at the workplace to continue unabated, advocacy is necessary to achieve the change, especially at the level where law are created or existing law are amended. And I'm talking specifically on, one, on C-190. The question must be asked, where does one begin? And the answer must be here and now. First of all, to determine if your respective government has the political will. Unfor unfortunately, most of them don't. Secondly, design your strategy. Who, why, what action or tactics, and when. Thirdly, ratification of the C-190 is the goal. One you have, once you have it, implementation follows. Fourth and the most important, don't give up. I'm going to take a page. Actually, it's more than a page. It is a twist on the slogan used by Jamaica Household Worker Union, JHW in Jamaica, which say respect equality and dignity every domestic worker's right. And I will put forth that this could be the rally cry for the advocacy across the world. Respect, equality, and dignity, the right for every domestic workers, from sea to sea, everywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much for this intervention, uh, both Daphne for reading it and for Joyce as well. And we do have a question to Clary Bed before uh, we move on to closing our session. The question is, does your union have a relationship with the Employers Association? And if so, uh, how helpful has it been in your experience? Clary Bed? We have also had a question about moving from informality to formality. So if one of our speakers who are present here today, so Asmao or Clary Bed would like to respond to that, please unmute yourselves. C'est moi? Oui. On vous entend. Ah, OK. OK, d'accord. Passage, la question, elle demande le passage à l'informalité sur la, la formalité, c'est ça? About going from the informal sector to the formal sector. That's the question, right? OK. We have a, an ILO recommendation. That's recommendation number 204 of ILO to be able to be aware of the articles that are used to go from informality to formality in the work situation of a domestic worker. So whoever is interested in this, they can read this recommendation personally to go from informality to formality in this sector, particularly speaking about domestic work. Many people think that we are in an informal situation, but a person who is subjected by other people, we mean that those who sell things next to the road, that's the informal sector. But for, for when we talk about domestic work, once we work for someone else, when we have a contract and when we have a salary at the end of the month, this means that we are moving towards formality. Hear us. There is a question for you as well. 
it is whether you are collaborating with the employers association and if so how helpful has it been Okay, so Claribad is here, but I cannot hear her. So maybe Stemo? I could ask some of our sisters from Latin America to shed some light on that. All right, so we have given it a try. Just a reminder that any questions that remained unanswered during the session would be responded to in our uh, report. So you would still get the response to this question, Ulrich. And thank you so much for our panelists, for Asma, Klariba, Joyce, the second panelist, and the first panelists as well. Before we close our session today, I would like to give the floor back to our general secretary, to learn about what IDWF could be doing in supporting this fight that we have heard about here today. Uh, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, I have been listening and learning a lot. Uh, it has been uh, one of the most inspiring panels uh, on, on this uh, uh, important topic. Uh, as the IDWF, uh, we have adopted a resolution back in our Congress in 2018 to eradicate violence and abuse of domestic workers for inclusive unions. So the IDWF will definitely prioritize uh, the ratification of the Convention 190 and and the eradication of the and violence against domestic workers. We are now uh, going to start uh, and educating domestic workers uh, on these issues through an online course and other training sessions in all the regions. So domestic workers will know their rights, will have better knowledge of this subject and how to deal with it. And we will continue to build coalitions with our, with our workers in other sectors, trade unions, feminist organization, human rights organization, migrant workers organization, uh, that through these coalitions, uh, we will be uh, stronger uh, to uh, get the ratification of the C-190 and, and also to get the law passed. And finally, I want to say that uh, for domestic workers to assess any rights is always a challenge. It's always a challenge. So we will make use of, uh, and we will be watching out and make use of every opportunity to get law passed to get uh, work done. And one of the good examples uh, we, we have not uh, talked about is the adoption of the sexual harassment law in Jamaica last month. This is a, a really rare piece of legislation on sexual harassment because in the law is specifically rights domestic workers are included. So this is uh, an important victory for, for domestic workers. And, and this uh, definitely is a good example for, for, uh, for all the governments to follow, you know, that domestic workers have to be explicitly included in all the laws, in all the policies for protection uh, against violence. So thank you, uh, it has been most inspiring and this is the beginning and let us, uh, work together and move forward. And before I close, I want to thank all the interpreters. You have done a good job. Thank you. Thank you. And if you can show yourselves, we will take a picture <laughs> together.
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Merci, à bientôt. Merci.